Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the virtual Einstein Forum. A very warm welcome also to our speaker, Michelle Shaoli, and to Stefan Wille, who will guide you through this evening and who will hopefully join us in a minute. Um, there he is. <laughs> Um, Stefan Willer is professor for German literature at the Humboldt University in Berlin. His research areas are manifold. Um, he, he covers uh, literary topics from the 17th to the 21st centuries. And amongst other subjects, he has dealt with the relations between literature and music. And this in particular makes him a very suitable conversation partner for Michel Charoli tonight, who in his lecture is not only interested in literature, but also in the uh, canonic way in general in which we approach any significant work of art. Before we begin, um, a few technical notes. If you have previously registered via Zoom for this event, you can participate with comments and questions. And of course, you are more than invited to do so. Please, for this, do not use the chat function, but the Q&A, or if you're using this program in German, the F&A function at the right bottom of your desktop. And you can write down your, your questions and comments in German as well as in English. And Michel Shaoli will choose in which language he will answer them. So um, that's enough from me. And now uh, I give the floor to Stefan Villa. And after this, Michel Shaoli. Yeah, thank you very much, Franziska Bomsky, and uh, I'm very happy to moderate this evening with Michelle Shaoli's lecture on failing and falling. So let me briefly introduce our speaker. Michelle Shaoli is professor of Germanic studies at Indiana University, Bloomington, where he also directs the Center for Theoretical Inquiry in the Humanities. So one might think that Michel Chauli is a theorist, which is probably true. <clears throat> After all, he is an expert in interrelations between literature and philosophy, in aesthetic theory, and in the history of philology and criticism. But actually, Michel's theoretical interest <clears throat> is quite practical, or as he himself puts it, poetic, which means occupied with producing, with making and doing. And uh, already his 2002 monograph on Friedrich Schlegel bears a very practical title, The Laboratory, the Laboratory of Poetry. It's about uh, the interrelations between chemistry and poetics in Schlegel's work. So it's about understanding theory, theory of poetry, in this case, as an experimental practice in the lab. Following this idea, Michel has directed a research project called the Philological Laboratory at the Freie Universität Berlin, where he has been affiliated as an Einstein Fellow since 2018. And of course, his status as Einstein Fellow fits very well with this lecture tonight at the Einstein Forum, if only this were really the Einstein Forum. <laughs> But uh, <clears throat> anyway, it's uh, an Einstein Forum lecture, of course. So that project on the Philological Laboratory had a subtitle, Models of Criticism Beyond Critique. Going beyond critique. This was already the idea of Michel Chauli's 2017 book, Thinking with Kant's Critique of Judgment. So thinking with, I think, as going beyond. And this is also the idea of his ongoing project called Poetic Criticism, which is, as one might say, a meditation on, again, Friedrich Schlegel's statement that poetry can only be criticized by poetry. And that, quote again, Friedrich Schlegel, a judgment of art that itself isn't a work of art has no right of citizenship in the realm of art. So high stakes. I think what follows uh, now is perhaps a side piece to this main project. And I'm sure that we will, non that we will experience Michel Chauli's idea and his practice of 
poetic criticism when he will talk about failing and falling ways of encountering literature. So I think it's uh, time for me to disappear now. Time for you, Michelle, to start your lecture, share your screen or whatever it is that you're going to do. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, for agreeing to uh, participate um, and for, uh, for this introduction. And thank you to the Einstein Forum for the, uh, for the invitation uh, to do this. Uh, I have to admit to you um, that I am unusually nervous uh, in starting this lecture. Uh, all of us have had uh, more than our fair share of Zooming. Uh, so one should be, I thought I should be used to this, um, but there is something extraordinarily strange um, in the fact that I am speaking at this point, as far as I can tell, uh, to nobody. Uh, I'm speaking to my laptop. And uh, so I don't have the, the fear of speaking publicly, but the fear, <laughs> if you want, of speaking privately, uh, of, of, uh, of just talking to myself. So um, I, I'm just telling you this so that if at times uh, I sound like a man who's talking to himself, it is because at this point I am a man who is uh, talking to himself. Um, I will try to conjure in my head um, uh, all of you, assuming there is an all, um, sitting uh, in various or standing perhaps in various spaces um, and perhaps listening. Uh, in any case, it's, a, it's, an, odd, uh, it's an odd experience. Um, this is also a little bit of an odd talk. It um, came about uh, as an, uh, um, after an invitation uh, to a, a colloquium uh, on the topic of failing. And that was all that we were told, failing. And um, so it really emerged out of an intuition where failing and falling somehow seemed to uh, in my head somehow to resonate and I didn't really know much more than that. Um, anyway, uh, so what you will see really has uh, nothing to do with scholarship or research or any other of these noble pursuits. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of reflection or um, even that's perhaps too noble. Um, just me trying to figure something out, which I hope uh, which I hope will um, interest you also. Um, uh, all of us, uh, I, certainly I am uh, an expert uh, in failing, uh, but, but there isn't, I don't think, a kind of uh, scholarship or a, or a science of it. So we, we always speak in a way from inside uh, this experience and, and what follows, um, as you'll see, is is very much that. Okay, so let me do this uh, screen sharing. I have a, a few slides um, and uh, it won't be for the whole time, but for part of, um, for part of this. Um, okay, so failing and falling um, is uh, my topic. Failing and falling falling and failing, only a small gap divides the two. The gap that separates the stem uh, of the first instance of the letter I from its dot. But what divides also connects. Close that gap with a mere hint of a stroke and you have turned failing into falling and with another stroke, wipe off a patch in that L and falling is failing once more. The stroke that divides failing and falling, the stroke that also links them, is a stroke of luck. It's lucky that the English language pairs these two words this way. It's thanks to an accident of linguistic history that the two look like twins. I couldn't have started quite this way in another language that I know. But it's a happy accident. It's such a happy accident that failing and falling look 
and behave like each other's shadows, that the greater wonder may be that not every language does the same. After all, do the two not belong to one another? Is it not true that for all of us, for you and for me, failing is before all else an instance of falling? And have we not all experienced falling first as a failure? Have a look what I mean. Screw you, Father. Soap. Soap, you're being aware. Screw you, Father. Shame. You know scenes like this. You've seen them, but more important, you have lived them. Once you too were a baby rising and flailing and falling, and you know that even if you don't remember it. There may be videos or photos starring you as the child not quite managing to stand. Failing and falling then are joined not just because of a fluke of English spelling, but because they're grounded in a fundamental physical condition that permeates human life and human existence. We live our lives pulled to the ground and pushing from it somewhere between heaven and earth. That makes it sound a bit fancier than I mean for pulling and pushing, unfortunately, do not, do not cancel one another, allowing us to dwell in a state of suspended hovering. That's reserved for the gods, for their messengers and their various assistants. They know how to approach the ground to within an inch without touching it, teasing gravity itself. We earthlings, on the other hand, we fly economy, we know rough landings, we tend to find ourselves in burdensome, often inelegant and sometimes violent tangles with gravity. Our aspirations aim high, our cultural norms point upwards, we reach for heaven or at least for outer space, but without fail, heaviness weighs us down. Everything we do happens on this field of unseen forces fighting it out. Even the most commonplace acts are not exempt. Right now, as I'm sitting in my chair, you are probably sitting in yours, staring at a screen just as I am. It doesn't look like much of an accomplishment, yet neither of us would stay sitting were it not for the ceaseless chatter of sensors nerve fibers, synapses, vestibular systems, and muscles holding us up. In no waking moment are we far from falling. And even in our sleep, we manage to fall. It's no surprise then how many of our cultural achievements turn on defying gravity. This is especially evident in feats of athleticism. Sometimes they take a brute force approach, lifting in the air what by all rights belongs on the ground. And since no practical aim is being served here, the purpose must lie in the fact that gravity itself has been denied its rights, if only for a moment. At other times, the human being builds for himself a launching pad that, like the magic carpet of fairy tales, carries him over the clouds and across the sky. Or the body finds ways of moving with such disregard for the laws of physics that we cannot even tell if it is rising or falling. 
Or last example, someone manages to take flight in a way that exceeds all utility and all necessity. There were definitely easier ways of scoring that basket. Everything in this gesture signals superabundance of strength, of beauty and boldness, even of insouciance. But there is, there is more of it, more of all of it than what is needed to get the job done, which makes the gesture into a gift, a pure gift, and lucky those who were there to receive it. How does all this relate to falling and failing? I've said that the two maintain an intimate relationship. They're not identical, true, but they do keep close company, which is why the measure of success, that is the observe of failing, often amounts to the obverse of falling, to counteracting falling, overcoming it, even here, as in the case of Michael Jordan, mocking it. The examples I've shown you bear this out, and it would be easy to think of many more from various spheres of life, whether it's children doing ballet or NASA putting men on the moon. In one way or the other, these enterprises celebrate the defeat of, or at least the temporary relief from, gravity and falling. Failure is taken to be so tightly aligned with falling and success, hence with its opposite, that an entire cottage industry of thinkers has made it its business to understand human beings through the single fact of the vertical posture. You know the basic idea, the upright gait, this thought claims, makes the human being makes really the essence of the human being. You also know that this can be metaphysical hocus pocus and immodest self-serving hocus pocus at that, even dangerous hocus pocus, for the idea is often used to bolster the claim of dominion over the horizontally postured inhabitants of the earth. Besides, it's not even cons consistently applied. Among the thinkers who claim that overcoming gravity marks human beings for supremacy, I've come across few, none actually, who advocate being ruled by bats and birds. I say all this to give you fair warning that I nonetheless plan to stay with this idea, at least for the rest of this talk. My justification is this, just because some versions of an idea amount to hocus pocus does not mean that the whole idea is rotten. In fact, my sense is that this idea rightly handled opens our view to the intricate ways that failing and falling are entangled and shows how this entanglement gives us purchase on some of the most significant modes of experience among these, the experience of literature and of other significant things. These objects are not significant per se, but become significant to us when we fall for them and when they befall us, which only works if we are in a position from which to fall, namely up and off the ground. I'll return to this idea at the end of the talk uh, but only briefly, too briefly. Before we get there, I'll ask you to spend some time in the company of the philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte, not something you do every day, I assume, and for good reason, since it's a decidedly mixed pleasure, as you'll see. But it turns out that one can learn a thing or two from some of these dead white guys. So first, though, let's go back for a moment to our little girl trying to stand up. What is going on here? On the face of it, her fall documents a simple failure to remain upright. The muscles exert themselves. We can see that clearly. 
but gravity prevails and the body tumbles to the ground, a question decided by physics. Yet right away, you see how inadequate the description is to the scene we watched. There is so much more going on. Note, for example, how persistently the girl applies herself to a task whose reward remains abstract. What awaits her on the far side of standing? There is no treat, not one we can see anyway, and she's already holding a toy in each hand. There is, well, what? What prompts her to keep trying and keep falling? It's hard to say. And another thing, note how cheerfully she falls. Is that the face of failure? If so, then I wish more failures on myself. It looks as though she were in a game, though also not quite, since games tend to have rules, even if they remain unstated. And it is hard to see what shape rules might take here. Perhaps we're witness to a form of play, though here too one wonders, can such loss of control be integrated into playing? Perhaps this is just a form of failing after all. That is how philosophers, at least those working in the Western tradition, uh, would tend to understand this scene. They would see in it a display of the indomitable human urge to break the shackles of gravity and take an upright posture. Let other creatures seek the safety and stability of crawling and slithering. Human beings leave all that behind to rise up to raise themselves up. It's a heroic account. And everything that distinguishes human beings, power, knowledge, skills, technology, is thought to depend on the one move we saw the baby make, the move out of the crouch and into uprightness. Countless thinkers and writers have commented on this move. Let me quote just one, the very Fichte I mentioned a moment ago, in a book he published 200 odd years ago. This is what he writes. In my view, the human species has freely raised itself, has freely raised itself off the ground and thereby acquired the capacity to cast its gaze around itself, allowing it to take in half the universe in the sky, while the eye of the animal, because of its position, is bound to the ground which carries its nourishment. This is just the kind of talk that we're tempted to dismiss as an expression of human-centered arrogance. Still, look how much Fichte draws from this one quotidian moment of getting to one's feet. Rising up, the human being raises itself above the animals, literally and figuratively, earning a warrant for dominion over the earth and the creatures that remain bound to it, or at least granting itself such a warrant. But Fichte's first concern is not power, but knowledge. For by his lights, it is from knowledge that power flows. Before ruling over the earth, human beings look around and observe for which they need to be upright. The straight back holds the head high, which lets the eye scan the heavens. If we follow Fichte's train of thought, we begin to see that the downward look of the animal and the upward look of the human being do not merely fix different objects, the source of nourishment here, the sky there. No, they embody entirely different forms of looking. One is bound by earthly necessity, the other free to roam the compass of the world. Even when they do focus on the same object, 
they see different things because they go about the act of looking differently. In standing up to gravity, what matters is the change in the quality of what can be known and the manner of knowing it. The animal's way of seeing is confined by instinct and shaped by the pressures of life. Human beings, however, Fichte suggests, once vertical are in a position, again, literally and figuratively, to behold the heavens, not with an eye to putting it to practical use, say to orient themselves, but as a phenomenon worthy of observation, contemplation, and reflection. A minute ago, we thought we were looking at a baby adorably teetering and tottering, and now we learn that in fact, we were watching a human being raise itself into philosophy. But if that is so, then a fall is far worse than a mere failure, since the human being falling out of its upright position falls not just to the ground, but also all the way into animality, into ignorance and bondage. I started with a child rising and then tumbling as the primordial case of falling and failing. Primordial because it is lodged in one of the earliest moments in our lives. Yet as much as this experience is each of ours, nobody can fall in my stead, this moment is not ours alone, part of a personal biography, but marks also the earliest points of the biography of the human species. That is something Fichte insists on. Here's what he writes just before the passage that I just read. It has been asked, he says, if the human being was destined to walk on four feet or upright. I think he's not destined for either of these. It has been left to him as a species to choose for himself his mode of locomotion. A human body can walk on four feet. People have been found who've been raised among animals and who can do this with incredible swiftness. In my view, the species has freely raised itself off the ground. This is uh, a case of a double origin then of ontogeny repeating phylogeny. By Fichte's thinking, each child straining to rise up, reenacts a movement performed by the entire human species. But that in turn means that every sway and wobble we saw in the video is not the child's alone, but repeats humanity's swaying and wobbling. When the child falls, it takes the human species down with it, which again, makes us wonder about falling and failing. Many things fall, keys and spectacles fall, rocks, buildings fall as do snowflakes. And in falling, they exhibit the triumph of gravity and the failure of anti-gravity, but they do not, generally speaking, pull down with themselves an entire species or class of things. There is something about the fall of the child, hence about the fall of the human species that is both less and more than a mere failure. And we can turn this idea around. The child can only fall the way human beings fall because human beings get themselves into a place that makes a fall possible. If you want a burlesque version of this idea, turn to Plato's dialogue Theotetus, where Socrates recounts the story of Thales, the famed mathematician and astronomer. So absorbed is, he, is Thales in studying the stars that he, prompts, uh, that he promptly falls into a pit. A servant girl who's watching this laughs at him. How does he expect to comprehend the world above when he cannot even see what lies inches from his feet? But Socrates 
<clears throat> Socrates wears the mockery and the fall as a badge of honor. The same jest, he says, applies to all who pass their lives in philosophy. All of them, that is, can be laughed at. You only fall the way Thales falls or Socrates falls. When you have glimpsed the universe in the sky, when you have faced the mystery and sublimity of the heavenly bodies, and when your gaze has bent back upon itself to include the place from which you gaze and the act of gazing itself. No wonder you overlook the pit by your feet. No wonder you fall. But so what? The ignorant may regard that, uh, that fall as a failure when in fact it is an index of your achievement. One strange and noteworthy thing about this anecdote is how it brims with aggressive laughter. The servant girl is not the only one who laughs. Her ridicule is met by Thales's retaliatory laughter, a laughter meant to signal how utterly insignificant the cares of the common people seem to him. What to make of this dueling hilarity? And what about the laughter in our video? We hear the giggle of the little girl, but there's also the chortling coming from a man whose place in the sequence is ambiguous. He's both in the scene and off screen. We hear him, but we do not see him. And we do not see him because he seems to be holding the camera, showing us this scene and at once invading it. Is his laughter like that of the servant girl? Is he laughing at the baby or with her? And we were invited to participate in the merrymaking. Why else put the video on YouTube? Why else send it to others? Do we align our laughter with one side or the other? Or does it come from a third position? What finally is funny about a baby not quite managing to keep her balance? Or for that matter, a man falling into a pit? I don't believe we'll be able to settle on answers to these questions, but they do alert us to the link between falling and failing and laughing. We all know that comedy is culturally highly specific, more so than other genres. Jokes tend to die in transit. Yet the humor in falling, a mysterious form of humor finally, seems to defy this truth. The pratfall falling on your rear end may be the closest thing we have to a globally cherished prank. Do we laugh to acknowledge how fragile our place is in the world? Were that so, how apt it would be since laughing, like the fall that prompts it, is available only to those creatures who have loosened their entanglement with the world. Only Human beings laugh and only human beings fall. You may think that uh, Fichte's account puts too great a stock in linking high-minded human capacities such as freedom and reason to the upright posture, and you would be right. In this, he echoes the many thinkers who have put forward similar ideas, yet he's unusual, I think, in acknowledging at least implicitly, the intimacy that exists between rising and falling. Yes, the human species, as Fichte puts it in another passage, moves its life, moves its life into the realm of light and keeps fleeing the earth, which it touches with that part of itself that is as small as possible. That is the soles of the feet or if you're a ballerina, just the tips of the toes. But it does so shadowed by the risk of falling. What is more, it is this risk, this risk of falling, 
that even makes the move into the light, into uprightness, uprightness possible. Look what Fichte writes, and that's the last quote that I'm sharing with you. Thanks to its daring gait, which is a continuous expression of its boldness and its skill in observing its balance, the human species keeps practicing its freedom and its reason remains in a state of becoming and expresses it. The human gait is daring, Fichte says, an expression of boldness. Why daring and why bold? Let me stop the screen sharing since I'm done with the slides. Why daring and why bold? We know the answer because with every step, human beings risk falling. Actually, that gives the risk and the boldness too little credit. This risk is not a regrettable side effect of walking, something that might ideally be managed away. Since to take a step, we need to jolt our already shaky position on two feet, dislodge one of the two pillars of our stability, which really is a fragility, and throw our whole frame into even greater imbalance. To walk, to dance, to skip, to run, is to run a risk. Not because you might fall, but because to walk, dance, skip, and or run, you must let yourself fall. Our way of walking, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer has said, is nothing but a perpetually hampered falling. There's nothing inevitable about the human species raising itself up. It's not our destiny, as Fichte insists, not our instinct. We could stay on all fours, safe and sound on the ground. Yet we try and try again, suffering one setback after the other, just so we can fall prey to the hazards of falling, to become imbalanced enough to go for a stroll, dash for a bus, kick a ball, or decide to waltz. You will have noticed that I've been talking more about falling and less about failing. At the outset, I said that failing and falling are joined in our earliest experience of getting off the ground, both as individuals and as a species. But as we have followed this train of thought, it has become clear that though the one is never far from the other, they do not coincide by no means. There are ways of falling that are not simply ways of failing. They are rather ways of being, ways of experiencing the world and acting in it. If Fichte, like much of the tradition of philosophy and anthropology to which he belongs, considers the act of raising oneself into the vertical as the moment that the human being steps out of the tangle of natural causes and into the freedom of beholding the world, of even having a world, then falling does not simply cancel this act, rendering it a mere failure. Falling has its own texture and its own truth. It opens ways of experience and discloses the world in its own way. Falling as a way of being, a way that courts failure without succumbing to it, describes some of the most significant experiences we human beings have, including the experience of encountering a work of literature, a painting, or a film. I can no more than sketch the thought since I have almost used up my time and your patience, so I'll be brief. When you read a novel or watch a movie, you engage in an intricate dance of activity and passivity. Your experience of reading or watching or listening places you into the passive role of someone who endures the feelings and impressions that others bring about in you. You might be amused or absorbed, bored or dismayed. Either way, you believe to have suffered these feelings. 
Yet you also know how much practice and preparation go into reading and watching and listening, how much you need to do to be affected and moved in the right sort of way. If we sought to grasp this ambiguous zone between activity and passivity, we could hardly do better than reach for the experience of falling as we've been following it here. One last step before I close. The philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty offers an analogy apropos of a different sort of falling. What happens, he asks, when I try to fall asleep? Other than in exceptional cases, I'm not felt by sleep against my volition, nor can I simply will its arrival as insomniacs can attest. Instead, I put myself into a position in which I may receive sleep. It is an important, an important feature of Merleau-Ponty's thinking that this getting into position involves both the body, how and where and with whom I lie down, and the mind, how well I'm able to keep my demons at bay, for example. True, I do not put myself to sleep, but rather fall asleep, which registers this loss of willing and control. Yet I do not usually fall asleep the way that a brick falls to the ground. Rather, I allow myself to fall. I put myself into a place so that this falling, falling asleep can befall me. This getting into the right place or getting into position is itself not something that just happens to me, but is rather something I need to learn. In fact, it can take years of practice of finding the right rituals, clutching the right objects, drifting into the right reveries to learn to do something as seemingly simple and natural as falling asleep. Some of us, perhaps most of us, never master it. Falling asleep, falling in love, falling in step, falling into error, falling into place, falling in line, falling for a man or for a woman or for a story. Are these ways of failing? No doubt they maintain a kinship with failing, distinguished from it by a mere stroke of luck or of the pen. It's likely true of all human ways of being that they remain cheek to jowl with failure. Yet it is just this kinship that falling keeps with failing that allows it to open to the human being entirely new and risky ways of being. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, for this great talk. Um, and these many ideas you gave us about falling and failing, and what this may have to do with uh, particularly falling for, well, literature, arts, but of course, also emotions, love. I was um, thinking, I think, Actually, ever since I uh, read the title of your talk, I, um, I, I kept uh, thinking about Daniel Harms, this uh, Russian avant-garde writer who died in uh, 1942 in, in Leningrad under the, the German siege. Um, and he has these many stories about falling. Um, of course, I only know the German translations, but I checked out some, some English translations. And I was going to ask you um, if, if whether you know him or or, or mm. not. Um, it's it's actually it's it's hilarious. It's very funny. <clears throat> it's about people uh, stumbling and tumbling uh, around each each other. Pushkin uh, stumbling over Gogol and Gogol stumbling over Pushkin and uh, Pushkin uh, sitting with his son at a table and both falling from their chairs. And there's a great story, and it's uh, simply entitled "Falling" or "The Falling." 
And I was going to ask you about this because it has to do with the temporality of falling. So there are two men falling from a roof. That's how the story uh, begins. Two men fell from a roof. And then there are people looking out of their windows and they, they are watching these men falling. So it says their fall was noticed first of all by Ida Markovna and so on and so forth. It's a five story building, but they keep falling and falling and falling. And everyone keeps looking and it's being stated what they are doing, the people looking out of the window, how difficult it is to open the windows to really watch these men falling until they finally hit the ground. And uh, so I was wondering uh, during your talk, um, what about the, the temporality of falling? So in the, in the first instances, the video with the girl, but also I think the, the, the music of, uh, of, of Fichte, it has to do with trying to stand upright and then, well, falling down or, or being able not, not to fall again. Um, in the in the end, I think the the instances with falling in love and how long it may take to even fall asleep that that was uh, much more about the temporality. So I was uh, I was wondering what you what 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 you can say about this uh, yeah this duration of the falling. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so what um, the what occurs to me to say first of all is that the. Um, that the duration of the kind of falling that I'm talking about is not the duration of an object falling. Because um, for, for this form of falling to have meaning, to be successful or to lead to meaning, it's not even that it has meaning, but it opens to the possibility of significance. Um, it's something that in a way establishes it's, itself only after it has happened. I will, I. Only once it has happened do I recognize, perhaps even recognize, maybe not even in all cases, <clears throat> that I have fallen. It is, um, it is shocking to see human beings fall uh, the way objects fall. And, and I think part of the comedy, it now occurs to me, may have something to do with that. It is to, in a way, um, lessen the shock of the human being becoming a mere body falling. Um, uh, and um, a, a, among the most, um, a, a, among the most, um, and maybe that's the, true of the, the story that you were referring to. Uh, there are several Monty Python skits also that, that hinge on human beings falling uh, um, uh, just outside the window as two people speak. Uh, so the humor, the humor there is a kind of, as, as so often, an, an, a nervous humor about something that can actually be quite horrifying. Uh, among the most disturbing images, at least to me, um, that that were connected uh, with a with a collapse of the World Trade Center towers on September 11th, 2001, was that of the, of the falling man, or there, was, there were many falling people, but there was one who was captured um, by a photographer um, of the New York Times, I believe. Um, and it, it, uh, that this, the, the idea of the, of the human being becoming an object that simply falls, like any other object falling from the, from the building, um, precisely i think uh, um, pointed to the to the horror when the kind of scenario that i was trying to describe breaks uh, when it's shattered um, entirely so within this mode of falling that i'm speaking about here which which is uh, which is a falling uh, that is risky but is not falling as an object we're not just like a, like this pen that can that can fall um, the temporality of it, I think, is very, very different. It really depends. It depends on, the, it can be anything from something you never recognize. It can be that after the fact, it will have been love at first sight, but of course you don't know it at the time. Um, what is the temporality of uh, encountering an artwork? Sometimes it happens in the first instance where when you know the curtain goes up, you see 
the first image of a, of a play or even of a film and you know you're in good hands and you have really no idea why you know this, but you have a deep intuition. And sometimes um, you read an entire novel and you're not sure what to make of it. So I don't think there is one way of thinking of this, but I would make this fundamental d distinction between ways of falling the way I've tried to describe it and ways of falling as objects. And we're not, precisely we're not objects when we fall in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. We have um, two questions, or actually I think it's a comment and a question. Um, Emma Chris uh, just said when you were um, about to finish that she was just going to ask about falling in love uh, that's the comment, but maybe you want to comment on that too. And I add uh, the question right away by Ricardo Martins. Could be the falling, failing, if looked at as achievement, be associated to a specifical task, aiming at a perpetual, almost reaching enlightenment, as if that is as good as it gets? Is falling, failing, the epitome of achievement? Hmm. Um, okay. Um, let me, let me uh, say, uh, say first about the falling in love. I, I, don't, I don't know if I have um, any particularly uh, insightful things to say about that, 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 not, every, that not anyone um, could say. Uh, but it, but merely to say that it, um, as everyone knows, um, again, we don't we don't fall in love um, the, the way objects fall, but that there is a kind of place from which one can fall, which is to say that there is a, um, a preparation is almost too uh, technical and pedagogical, but that there is um, a preparedness uh, which we may not even be aware of ourselves that makes it possible, um, just like, uh, just really like the, the, the falling asleep. Um, they're not perfect uh, analogies, um, but my point in all of this was, this is something that the anthropologist Helmut Plesner uh, emphasizes, that this kind of falling really is only possible when you have disentangled yourself from the world of, um, instinct and immediate responsiveness to the world. So that's the, that's the world that Fichte was talking about when speaking about the animal being um, attached to the world and looking for nourishment. Now, one can describe this completely without pathos as Plesna tries to do it and simply say that once there is an uh, uncoupling, uh, um, a, uh, a, a space that's created, not just between me and the world, but between me and myself. I'm no longer just the one, but there is a, um, that there is a gap between myself. Then something that, like this experience of falling, and it can be falling in love, can, can take place. Um, I, can, I can be utterly unprepared and become tone deaf for it. Uh, as it happens in some periods of life. And, and then I may be in the most uh, promising situation and it will not take. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure um, about the um, Sisyphean task uh, and whether this is as good as, it, as, good, good as it gets, I'm sorry, um, is falling and failing uh, the epitome of achievement. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that we can uh, uh, rank, rank these things. So I'll, I'll set this aside if, if, if it's okay. Perhaps, the, uh, perhaps Ricardo Mar Martins can uh, intervene again and, and clarify or, or elaborate the question and we'll, I'll try again. Okay, for the time being, we have another anonymous uh, question. Um, about your thoughts on falling sick, another instance of uh, falling into something that is not as, uh, well, uh, yeah, falling sick, especially in, that's the question, especially in asymptomatic cases where one never realizes that they were sick. Ah, but if you never realize, then I don't know if you were really ill. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. I'm quite torn about this um, <clears throat> because 
because I think in most cases, falling Ill, Ill is probably not like falling asleep um, or, or falling in love or falling, uh, falling for art, um, but, but much more uh, being besieged by it. But here I'm b b besieged by something, but here I'm putting my cards on the table. There, there are people who believe that you only fall ill if, if in a way you have let down your guard or you have prepared yourself for it. Um, I'm not, I think, of that school. Uh, I don't think that um, in most cases we are in some ways responsible uh, for that. Uh, but again, I, I, I'm, I'm not um, entirely sure about this and certainly not dogmatic and, and happy to be talked out of this position and, and taught something else. So this is um, unfortunately where the, this technology is a little inadequate. I would have loved to hear what the person actually has to, has to say about this, uh, but that's all I can say about it. Okay. So here is uh, another question by Peter Skolin. Do you like the expressions, I fell out with him or her, and so we split up? And another expression, we used to get on well, but we had a fallout. Mm -hmm. So what about these expressions? Yeah, falling out. So um, let me say in general, they're, they're interesting we're thinking about. Uh, as I was working on this, I um, took some notes on uh, ways that uh, the notion of uh, falling comes up in English expressions. Um, and there, there, there is a very large number, as you can imagine. Um, there is a danger in trying to make each one of them work in some ways, um, because they just run in so many different uh, in so many different ways. Um, I, I was, um, uh, as I was working on this, I was trying to imagine what this talk would have sounded like had I done it in German. And Fall um, has a, a, an, an entirely other set of possible resonances. Um, it's not, I don't think it's smaller or bigger, at least I haven't measured it. It's just quite different. Some of it overlaps and a lot of it doesn't with the English falling. And it would have been a very different talk, but I worry if it would have been too different, which is to say that there should be something about these ideas that also keep at bay some of the enticements coming from, uh, from language, from linguistic possibilities. Um, so a falling out with somebody uh, that often does correspond to the phenomenology of what I'm talking about, where you don't exactly have an account of the causality of something, but you simply find yourself into a, in a situation for which, however, in a way you were prepared or you were preparing without having realized it. So that probably um, uh, you can fall out of love you and the way you can you can fall into love, though, again, they are not exactly symmetrical. Um, so that probably works, but, but I'm not gonna try to make it work for every, every way in which the word comes up. Um, that's in a way that would be cheating and it would be too good if, it, if, if that were to work. I think language is far too unruly and, um, and uncontrolled for that to, to actually function this way. Mm. I still would uh, very much like to hear your thoughts about the, the German uh, Fall uh, in, the, in the meaning of case, because in the, it's, it's, it's not just a, a German uh, specificity, it has to do with the Latin semantics of the case and the casus and the cadere. So we have some kind of falling there, which is, I don't know what it is. Is it also the, the, the musical uh, cadency? Uh, so it's, it has to do with falling into place or falling into a pattern, mm -hmm. but is there also some kind of uh, downward movement engaged? I'm, I'm always wondering about that. So when, when I start uh, playing in, in, in my mind with, uh, with the semantics of the German Fall. With the Fall. Mm -hmm. um, I think it... it it, uh, I think there is, um, the, the way that I would have, if this had been in German, um, the way I think that um, 
some of this would have played out is I would have taken up one train of thought that I that I completely set aside here, namely the entire um, the entire not well not just metaphorics but the entire story of the fall of man, um, and so in German uh, it's interesting it's Sündenfall. Uh, and there the word fall actually, I think, means something somewhat different from fall of man, uh, or at least the way that fall of man is understood usually, um, where it's some, something about going down. While Sündenfall is, is a case, is a case of a, um, of a sin. Um, and so there, um, with, with casus and case uh, and fall in that sense, uh, the the semantic possibilities that open are really interesting because on the one hand it is um, a, a something terrible that that can befall you um, if, when if I if I remember now the many de uh, definitions of casus in the Latin dictionary but it is also a chance or an opportunity um, so it's an accident but an accident can also in the sense of a, of a chance, uh, um, not just a chance event of, in the sense of randomness, but of, of an opportunity. So this would have opened up the, a way of reading the fall of man in this direction, which is to say, um, it, is, it is not merely as, um, as a certain tradition um, in theology uh, would have it um, a, a, uh, an event that closes something, but it is also something that opens something, namely it, it takes the human being out of a situation where there is no play, where there's no, um, where, where, where everything fits perfectly and introduces difference or openness or a gap in the, in this, um, in the existence of the human being. So in that sense, it's an, it's an opportunity. And so Fallen for me would have been a way of um, or fall and fallen would have been a way for me to explore that whole. And that doesn't seem to me gratuitous. I think that fits here very nicely. Um, but anyway, that's another talk. Mm. Okay. So we have several questions. Uh, let me uh, first um, have the, the follow-up question or remark by Ricardo Martins uh, as for the, the mm -hmm. falling, failing as a Sisyphean achievement. Uh, so he says it's about the constant drive to pull oneself up as the achievement itself, the attempt of reaching the top of the mountain as the setting up of the path to our next fall, to our next achievement, and not a failed attempt at actually reaching the mountaintop. Hmm. Okay, um, we may have to talk about this in person. I don't think I fully understand, but certainly the story that I was not that I was trying to tell is not about a heroic story of overcoming um, uh, obstacles, uh, gravity being the obstacle that that is central here, and reaching the top. But that was precisely that the movement of rising is 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 key because it enables certain kinds of falling. Um, and that's what's exciting about it. It's not just the ri rising part, but it's the falling part that's, uh, that's what's enabling and, and world opening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we have a question from uh, Rüdiger Zill. How do we know that the little child is failing? That its only goal is raising. It tries again and again, and it's not crying, but laughing. So falling is at least as much joy as frustration. Maybe falling is so much fun for it that it's doing it again and again, not because of overcoming the supposed failure, but of repeating the success. Maybe the perception of the falling as failing is a projection of adults. So the child's laughter has a completely different reason than the father's. Yeah. I Completely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, in fact, I wish I had put it as clearly as you have. Uh, that's the that's precisely the uh, at least one reading that I was trying to suggest as a as a possibility. Uh, you're I think you're absolutely right. The, the, there is a pleasure in the child's falling. And that's exactly the pleasure, I think, that we then discover in our own ways of falling, uh, which is why for me, it wasn't the fall of man that was the canonical way but the fall of the little girl that I that I wanted to go to because there the precisely the pleasure in this became so so obvious but this is also not 
she's not falling the way a rock falls, right? I mean, the, the pleasurable way of falling is, is exactly that this is part of this play activity uh, where she understands that she is in this zone um, between being able to control something and not being able to control it. But I completely agree with you that the idea that this is just a failure is um, a, a kind of Fichtean um, or, or a, or a uh, narrowly Fichtean uh, reading of this. I, I entirely agree. It's a much more complex and, um, and pleasurable um, uh, encounter. Okay. Just uh, want to remind everyone that questions can also be asked in German. So if you are more comfortable with German, that's no problem at all. Um, anyway, Gunther Jekeli is interested in your views of failing and overcoming failure. Just a second. Um, would you make a direct analogy to falling and standing up? How do you see this on the level of society? Maybe not as Fichte applied to the human species, but to somewhat smaller groups or communities. So first of all, hello, Günther. Um, nice to see you. Well, nice not to see you here, but nice to know that you're there. Um, so I, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. I'm interested in, in the views on failing and overcoming failure. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I have views about that. Um, I, I mean, because the, the kind of failing I was talking about is of course not, um, you know, not the, the ordinary failures of everyday life, but but precisely the, if you want the the existential failure that we're that we're dealing with by by being the kinds of creatures that disentangle themselves enough from the uh, entanglement of the life world to be able to fail in this way. Um, so there isn't a um, a value uh, necessarily to be put on this as a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, it is just what, what opens a certain dimension of existence for us and without which uh, you and I would not be able to be having this conversation. I may have misunderstood your question. If I have, please, um, please uh, correct me and, and specify it. Okay, so um, Joel Westerdale, asks or comments, how about orbiting? That is the process of continually falling and failing to land. Sometimes a text proves easier to orbit than to approach. Hmm. So hello, hello, Joel, also. Um, uh, funny to be in the conversation with somebody I haven't seen in, in years. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that you took the time to be here. It's a, it's a, uh, and it's, it's the kind of question you would ask. Um, it's a very clever question. I don't know. Um, I haven't thought about orbiting. I don't think that orbiting is the kind of thing that we do really. Um, I think when you, it feels like you're orbiting something, you're not orbiting it the way uh, a planet uh, does in a regular uh, orbit, um, but uh, it's, a, it's, much, it's a much more complicated and much wobblier thing. It's probably a, a dance, um, but you tell me uh, what you think. I don't, I don't think of the orbit as a good description of how I deal with things. They either attract me or they repel me, um, but I don't feel like I just maintain the same distance to something and then stay with it. Um, so that, that phenomenology doesn't, doesn't uh, resonate with me. Uh, but again, this would be a great case of hearing this from somebody else. And I was uh, thinking about this guy who did this crazy uh, jump, parachute jump, but I think it was without, without a parachute actually from the stratosphere uh, some years yeah. ago. Yeah, you know? yeah. The um, so maybe yeah. The, the systematic part of that question could be how much jumping is involved in, uh, or can be involved in, in falling. So falling 
to earth uh, by, yeah, you, you had this terrible, of course, instance, of people jumping out of windows, but uh, mm -hmm. using a parachute and, and, and jumping or do the, doing this kind of base jump or whatever it's, it's called. So the, the, the uh, extreme uh, sports version of maybe yeah. falling or, or not falling. I don't know if it, if it yeah, no, no, I can see that and, and it would be um, worth thinking about, but it, that's very different from what Joel was talking about, which is orbiting, which yes. I think he imagines that there is perhaps something forbidding, um, but also not something entirely repulsive uh, about, um, about an object. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think what, what kind of falls in that category for me, perhaps the, the novels of Thomas Mann, mm -hmm. uh, which I've never really been um, uh, particularly attracted to, but I can also not entirely um, dis or, or, or be, be completely indifferent to them. Uh, and maybe the relationship to something like that would be a, a kind of cold orbiting. Um, I suppose you can do the orbiting um, Joel, that you're talking about in a kind of scholarly mode where in a willful way you distance yourself from something. Um, but that's precisely the kind of mode actually of encountering literature that I um, want to set aside because I think that that's a, uh, that's a fruitless uh, or, or yeah, that's a, not a particularly fruitful one. Um, but I suppose it can be done where an object, where, where I kind of estrange myself from the object in a kind of willful way and keep it at arm's length uh, all the time. Don't let it get close to me or me to it. Again, I'm not sure that that's what you're talking about, but uh, I can imagine that that, that that could work along the lines you were, you were saying. I see two more questions, but I think we have the time for a couple more questions if you feel like it. So Benjamin Robinson, uh, wonderfully evocative talk, he says, is there hypothetical imperative at stake in the species escaping the Gängelband? That is, are we commanded in a sense to fall and fail, but still with the idea that we realize in that way a capacity? But if the failure is definitive, that is, we don't realize the capacity in the end, then it becomes something darker, less a matter of hilarity, delight, and insouciance, but rather shame and bitterness. Is mm -hmm. there a kind of risk which we might suspect to be shameful from the beginning? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a wonderful question. So also, um, Ben, thank you for the question. Thank you for, for being here. Um, a wonderful, wonderful question. These categories, some of which I introduced, like insouciance and so on, um, are of course very belated ones. And and um, if you want an existentialist account, would would not have room for the idea of shame. I think uh, shame would would in a way have to come in much later once a scaffolding had been built. Um, but I take your point. Um, I think Fichte, one, one idea of his that I didn't pick up, um, Fichte's, uh, Fichte's insistence on the notion of freedom is for me a very interesting one. Remember, he says that the, that the human being freely gets up, right? There is no need, there is no instinct, and there is no pressure uh, in this sense. Uh, but the human being, now the species, as a species, as he says, freely gets up. And this idea of freedom is one of those ideas that I think is, is self-founding, which is to say, of course, the freedom does cannot yet exist when, when you have not gotten up uh, to entitle you to get up. So it, it is one of those things that emerges or that is established or born, if you wish, precisely in the act of raising up, even if that act then um, is beset by, by the kinds of darknesses that you, you speak about. Um, but it may be that that there isn't um, uh, so freedom is not a choice in this in this sense of uh, um, fichtes. It's not that we have the choice to do this or that. We just do it, and freedom emerges as 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 we do this. And in that sense, we don't have a, we don't have a choice but to enter freedom, uh, if if that makes sense. And the kinds of um, failures that you describe, Ben, I think completely attend. Uh, the process of, of 
of being of rising into freedom just as the uh, as the possibilities um, as the as the um, euphoric possibilities um, emerge so um, that's that's a much longer that's a bit of the talk that I did not uh, include but it's a, it strikes me as a politically uh, rich uh, dimension of this of this possibility this birth into into freedom so it's a second this rising oneself is precisely a second birth it's not the biological birth but the birth into freedom Gunther Yekeli replied once more, and then we have another question. Um, Gunther Yekeli says, yes, I mean existential failures mm -hmm. that can be utterly destructive. Falling, mm -hmm. at least for me, has also many positive associations. Failure has mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can see that. Though, again, we are often uh, completely um, incorrect about our own failures, right? That is our, our judgment about what we take to be failures are not necessarily, um, uh, not necessarily to, be, to be trusted. So who am I to know whether I have just now experienced the failure or not? I think it might be one. Uh, on the other hand, it might actually at the same time be a file in the sense in the sense we're talking about earlier, namely an opportunity or a chance for something else. So, um, so it's very difficult, I think, but the question would be by what yardstick uh, would you even think of something being a failure? And it seems to me that that's uh, given the framework we're talking about really not possible. You simply have to take it as that which is available to humans, namely, as I said, to live between heaven and earth, to live in a space that is not fully guided um, by either possibility, the possibility open to the gods, we're, we're entering Kleist's territory here, to the gods or, or uh, mere objects, um, but one, or, or a space where it is at issue, the question of meaning, which is why artworks come in also, is at issue about what is it, what even is a failure and what a success, and that we, we cannot know, I think, at, at any given uh, time. Mm -hmm. I, I do think there is something rather positive about failure, or maybe one might say there, there is a certain, uh, it, it has become uh, quite fashionable, at least in, in cultural studies. <laughs> so uh, maybe you can say something about that, that, um, that conference you attended about failing. Uh, so at, at least we might think about uh, Beckett's uh, Fail Better, uh, which is not optimize yourself, but it's, it's about affir affirming failure, if, if, if that is uh, at all possible, or, well, it, it, it's some kind of, um, maybe some, some kind of double negation. I don't know what it really is, but uh, you will certainly have some, some ideas about that or, or experiences from, from what you read about failing and failure. Right. Well, I think the, um, the, the conference was in a way encouraging us in exactly that direction. And, and many, many of the attendees um, found ways of, of uh, speaking about the productivity of failure, which is completely interesting and important. My point in this context was that it's actually not at all clear how to disentangle precisely uh, failing and succeeding and falling is is the hinge term in this uh, and not because we don't have enough knowledge or because you might consider something to be a success in, but simply because the kind of situation into which this releases us and again for me here it's precisely why artworks are the canonical ways of doing this because they are all about this is they raise the they completely open up the question of even being able to think what a failure might be and what it what it might not be. Not that, oh, I have a failure, but it turns out it was a good thing. Be, you know, I was rejected from Harvard, but it turned out that that was a that that worked out well for me. Uh, and it would have been a catastrophe had I, you know, you know these, you know that that kind of story. That's not what I'm um, speaking about, but that it in any given case, it's not even, it's there, there isn't even a, a um, uh, a, a framework or a yardstick that allows me to make this judgment because I'm, I'm responding and it's always belatedly and after the fact that I try to make sense. Yeah. 
So um, I think this is the last question, um, at least the, the last on the, on the, on the slide. Um, since we are on the subject of language and falling asleep was briefly discussed, I'm thinking of my mother tongue, Punjab, where we say that sleep came to me. Mm -hmm. We say the same of memory. How funny that when falling asleep, there is sometimes the sensation of actually falling that pulls one out of sleep. Okay, the last bit out of sleep, I don't quite follow because it's what you, you feel. I, and sometimes I actually do feel it. You, 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 you really almost feel that some part of you, some kind of a heavy soul is, is, is losing its grip on the conscious uh, world and, and really disappearing. And it's a, it's a delicious moment when you can half experience it, this, this disappearing. Um, but the the uh, expressions that the um, that the person uh, is referring to actually resonate very well, I think, with what we've been talking about. Um, this idea of something coming to me uh, uh, precisely uh, also uh, echoes this notion of an active passivity um, that I was trying to um, get at. That the active passivity being the uh, the condition under which we can receive both sleep and the artwork. Uh, so it has to feel like something that comes to me, but of course this coming to me has to be also within the context of me being able to, to receive it, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a, this famous uh, passage from a letter by Kafka to um, one of his friends saying that, that, um, that he wants a book to work on his soul like an ax, like an ax um, dividing the soul. And it always <clears throat> uh, leads people to think of the act of reading the way that Kafka describes it as purely passive, right? So how can I be anything but passive in being the recipient of an ax cutting itself into me? Um, and I always thought that this was a, it, it's a, it's a highly evocative and powerful description, but it's also misleading because it, it underplays, it understates the degree to which I have to be even, um, I have to be a, a, a recipient for this ax. Not that I have to be awaiting it or asking for it, but I have to be I have to be the kind of person who's ab even able to feel that an axe has landed, right? So when we know um, many people, including ourselves, when we're not attentive or have a tin ear, where no amount of axe wielding can, can um, achieve anything. So this, this passivity really has, it cannot be a pure passivity. It is not the passivity of a body falling or of something landing on me. Uh, but it is the, the active passivity required uh, for, for this experience. Okay, thank you, Michelle, for answering these questions and for keeping on uh, thinking about this very interesting matter. There's one more. Okay, so that's uh, an, another thank you uh, for the beautiful and suggestive talk, and I can just uh, say the same. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, yeah, I think I'm uh, going to give the last words for to Franziska Bomsky for clothing, closing the session and, and ending the meeting for all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, first of all, also from me, a big thank you to Michelle Shelley for a very inspiring talk, to you, Stefan Villa, and to the audience for a very vivid discussion. I think it's, it was very inspiring also. Um, let me conclude with a note on our next event, which will also be the last event of the Einstein Forum for this year and uh, belongs to the series of the so-called Potsdamer Gespräche in 2020. On this Thursday, December 10th at 6 p.m., Linda Hacker, who is a provenance researcher at the Museum Barberini, will talk about the very different ways museums found to responsibly handle uh, Nazi looted uh, assets, art in their collections. And you can all um, uh, sign up for this event like you did for this one. And hopefully we'll see all of you there. 
for now. Um, I wish you all a very pleasant evening and uh, bid you farewell. Thank you very much to all. Thanks, Stefan.